Hey everybody, Tony D with another video about screenwriting. Welcome to Screenwriting Tips. Today we're going to talk about how to write a thriller. Thrillers, okay, that's one of those genres or subgenres, depending on how you want to call it. It's, um, it's so broad, it's a little hard to define. There are a lot of movies they lump in there that aren't necessarily thrillers they might or more like like for instance when one of the lists I looked at on the internet had Looper in it now Looper's a pretty decent movie it's pretty exciting I don't know if I'd call it a thriller to me Looper is more of a science fiction movie because the entire movie hinges on time travel now there's certainly thrilling elements in it uh, but uh, doesn't really strike me as a classic thriller. To me, a, a, a thriller is not gonna have supernatural or science, science fiction elements. You know, Shine, The Shining was on the list. And again, that's, you know, it's a great movie. I love The Shining, but I wouldn't call it a thriller. I mean, to me, that's more of a horror movie. Uh, you know, to me, thrillers, they tend to have a lot of action in them, uh, more so than say just a drama there tends to be a lot of a lot at stake um, I, I guess I would define thriller as usually a real-life situation where the characters where there's a lot at stake so I guess there could be not that much action there's not that much action in rear window and I would think that movie, and a lot of the Alfred Hitchcock movies, you could consider thrillers um, because it is pretty thrilling, uh, but there's not a tremendous amount of action in Rear Window. I mean, there is and there isn't. It's almost like Hitchcock brings the stakes so far down initially that uh, any amount of action after that, after that sort of foundation is laid, is pretty exciting. <laughs> so that that's a technique that I think have been, has been lost in a lot of modern movie makings. Uh, uh, modern movies tend to be so big, right? A lot of the indie guys will do, you know, low stakes dramas and stuff, but they're more, mostly forced to do it because they don't have the money and, and, and the backing. You know, I complained about in one video, I don't know if it made the the cut, but I complained about the Hateful Eight in that, you know, it was a Western, but then uh, Tarantino, you know, basically stages it almost like a play. You know, he shoots it in 70 millimeter and then once he gets inside, he pretty much stays there, uh, which I think was a weird thing to do <laughs> in that particular instance. Um, but anyhow, I digress. Getting back to thrillers. So thrillers, I, I, you know, they have they they have to be exciting. Uh, they're usually dramatic. They usually have some amount of action in them. Uh, there's usually a lot of mystery, so, or, or or definitely there's some reveals in there that are mystery like. It's not necessarily a detective solving a crime. Uh, Seven is listed, and Silence of the Lambs. Uh, I think Silence of the Lamb is a good thriller. There's a lot of elements in there that are that are thrilling and um, you know uh, uh, they're scary, but it's not about the scares. <clears throat> if that makes any sense, you know, in a horror movie, I think in The Shining it's more about the scares a little bit than it is about you know and, and a lot of other elements. It's not really about a thrill ride per se. I think a lot of the modern horror movies you know, with the exception of like the Saw movies or Hostel movies, they tend to be thrilling movies. They're not really horror movies. They tend to be sort of marketed as horror movies sometimes, <clears throat> but then they're really more thrill movies, like that movie, what the heck's it called? The one where all the teenagers have to do all the challenges on the phone in some kind of weird app and they make money. Um, they just started showing that movie again. I didn't see it. So, if you're writing a thriller, what do you have to do? Well, just like in a lot of movies, you have to, uh, in the first act, introduce the characters and the situation. Uh, you want to start low as possible. 
and uh, not really kick things up. So, you know, you look at North by Northwest, which is, if you haven't seen North by Northwest, God, go see it. Um, North by Northwest kind of hits the ground running, which is what I love about it. Uh, but the stakes start pretty low despite that. Uh, uh, Cary Grant plays this guy, Roger Orth O. Thornhill, who's just, he's just a salesman of that era. He seems a little too well-dressed and handsome uh, when you watch the movie, but you have to understand the context of the day. You know, he was trying to be a typical businessman, you know, in a hotel somewhere. And um, back then, uh, the, the era of landlines, when you had a phone call, the uh, uh, somebody like a bellhop would come through the lobby with a sign with your name on it to let you know you had a phone call, right? So, uh, lots of spoilers ahead. So, um, this sign goes up a calling for somebody known as George Kaplan and Roger just happens to get up at that moment and uh, head for the phone for completely different reasons. And because he does, he's mistaken for George Kaplan. And uh, there are these spies who have been looking for him, Kaplan, forever. And they assume uh, Roger is Kaplan and they kidnap him and usher him into a car. And that's how the movie starts. So that's a great start. Now, we don't really know much about Roger up until that point. We sort of get to know him um, because we had that great dynamic of him just being like totally clueless and you know the other guys being like you're gonna tell us what we need to know Kaplan so um, you quickly get to know him and realize that he's just sort of a hapless boob who's wandered into something very serious in rear window uh, the setup the stakes are even lower Jimmy Stewart plays a photographer, he's, his leg's broke, he's stuck in his apartment until he heals, and he's bored, and he's looking out his rear window uh, in, I think, New York, um, where he can see into the windows of his neighbors, and, uh, you know, again, this is a different time. I don't, I don't think he had a TV, and back then, TV wasn't, you know, wasn't like a million channels, there might be three. So... Uh, he's just bored, you know, he's done reading, he's, 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 you know, he's got a broken leg, he's laid up for, for a while, he's in a wheelchair, so he's just watching, uh, watching the people and what they're doing, and he's so bored, he's getting to know those people in the other windows. Um, and he's got a girlfriend, and, you know, so the stakes are really low, it's really just him being bored, and then he sees something in one of the windows, which you know, starts the movie off into, uh-oh, what did he see? Did he witness a mur murder or did he just witness something that he thinks is a murder? Uh, so that uncertainty uh, drives part of the movie and it's, it's, it's good to have a little uncertainty, especially in the first act. It kind of keeps the audience off balance a little bit. Maybe they don't know where it's going. Um, you know, Rear Window is such a classic, you kind of already do, but... I think they made a remake of it, I want to say with Shia LaBeouf, or someone around that age, and he had, uh, it, it was like rear window, except uh, he was trapped in his house because he, he got arrested and had an ankle bracelet thing on or something. Anyhow, so your setup for your, your, your thriller should be relatively dull and boring. Um, you know, if you want to count, uh, well, let's talk about The Silence of the Lambs. Now, that's not exactly boring in the sense that there is an interesting dynamic already in that there are murders happening, which is, you know, pretty exciting. But it is presented in a very, um, you know, routine and antiseptic way. You know, it's a bunch of professionals just doing their jobs. So it's not personal yet. It doesn't get personal in Silence of the Lambs until uh, the main character goes to visit, played by Jodie Foster, goes to visit Hannibal Lecter to gain some insight into the, the potential murderer and hopefully, you know, get some clues on, on who this guy is so she can capture her, him. Um, 
And then the thrill in that movie is about can she capture uh, the the Buffalo Bill, <coughs> excuse me, serial killer before he kills uh, was it like a senator's daughter, I think, someone like that. So what's at stake is important in a thriller. You know, in Rear Window, what's at stake is Jimmy Stewart's safety because he has a broken leg and he's stuck in his apartment. Um, what's at stake in um, North by Northwest, you kind of discover and um, it turns out that it's, you know, Cold War sort of spy stuff. So really, kind of the fate of the United States is at stake. That's, that was always sort of the implication in a movie of that era. In, um, you know, in any kind of thriller, there has to be something important at stake because you want to give the audience a sense of loss if, if the character loses. And you want to make it feel like they could lose, you know. They're not going to lose, of course, most thrillers. Um, but you want to give the audience the feeling like, you know, in, in Silence of the Lambs, the way they achieve that, big spoiler ahead, is that they capture Buffalo Bill, but then Hannibal gets away. So it keeps you in that uneasy feeling. So it also set up, you know, the potential for a sequel, which we didn't get, but not, not with a cast anyway. Um, so there's that. In uh, North by Northwest, you know, or, or in most, Hitch most Hitchcock movies, because they're a little older, they tend to be happier endings, I would say, to some degree. Not totally happy in some of, some of them. I mean, but, you know, in North by Northwest, the thrill is kind of over, you know, after a while. And a lot of thrillers, it can be over. You know, the thrill part happens in the third act. You get the big chase or the big confrontation or whatever you want to call it and then you're done. Uh, maybe you can do the Tales from the Crypt thing, like nobody's ever safe. That's a little more horror than thriller. The important thing I think about a thriller is there's gotta be a lot of twists. The audience shouldn't quite know where things are going. And just like in a comedy or a horror, there should be a big reveal at the end that's a surprise, you know? Uh, the, the final thrill should be the biggest one in, in North by Northwest. Spoilers. Uh, it is the big chase on top of uh, Mount Rushmore. And then, uh, you know, whether or not the, the characters will, will climb off of it. You know, in that movie, it's going to be pretty obvious what happens. In North by, um, in Rear Window, you know, the final bit is about the murderer, you know, whether he's going to be caught or whether he's going to kill Jimmy Stewart and, uh, you know, finally, uh, and finally get away with it. Although, again, it doesn't seem likely that he'll get away with it, but you kind of have to, when you watch an older movie, you have to kind of watch it in context, right? You know, most people these days, if the, if a movie ended with a guy trying to kill another guy in his house, you wouldn't think it was very plausible that the murderer could get away with it. In an era like the 50s or 60s, that was a lot more possible. I mean, they didn't have a lot of, uh, you know, video cameras, uh, certainly forensic evidence wasn't as sophisticated. So if you cleaned up the blood and wiped off all your fingerprints, got out of there without anybody seeing you, you're pretty much in the clear in that era. So that's why it's sometimes, you know, when, when people of today watch movies from that era, if they don't keep that in mind, you know, they don't get it. They don't get the context. Same thing with North by Northwest and the phone, you know. If Roger O. Thornhill had a cell phone, there'd be absolutely no reason for him to get up. You know, uh, he wouldn't have 
there'd be no reason to have a there's no bellhops anymore <laughs> it'd be and there'd be no reason for anybody to walk through the lobby with a sign somebody's name on it really you'd have to make up a totally new reason so it's important to keep the context for those movies especially if you're watching Hitchcock but Hitchcock was really great at doing those kinds of movies um, I think one of the things you need to center on if you're doing a thriller for your protagonist is a vulnerability that your protagonist has and if you don't have one that's built in like in rear window it's built in Jimmy Stewart's broken his leg that's his you know that's his big vulnerability he's in a wheelchair he can't get out of his place easily it's it's also not an era where where it was very wheelchair accessible so uh, in North by Northwest Roger O Thornhill doesn't really have any big noticeable um, drawbacks or vulnerabilities uh, uh, except for the fact he doesn't know what's going on but they create one in the famous scene in the cornfield where Roger takes the bus to the middle of nowhere which again you know context and he's in the middle of this open field and he's waiting for somebody to meet him but he's been set up and then they come down with the plane and try to get him so uh, another great scene God, if you haven't seen that movie, man, you're missing out. It's a, it's a great movie. So, you know, it, thrillers thrive on that vulnerability. I think with a lot of modern films, you know, they'll, they'll go for those things, but they tend not to build up the vulnerability of the characters because they're kind of too either in love with the characters or, you know, there's a lot of ego, I think, with making movies, uh, especially with actors. And actors sometimes don't want to look vulnerable on screen. Uh, they don't want to do things that make them, you know, become unlikable to their audience or to their fans. So they tend to skip over all that. And I think, you know, everybody's just in such a rush to collect their paycheck these days. They don't really take time to craft these movies or think about them. It's just like, ah, oh, we got a thrill, thrill a minute ride here with cars exploding and, you know, things dropping from the sky. Yeah, we don't need a whole bunch of nonsense that's psychological. But I think that stuff makes those scenes important. I mean, you can do a, a thriller or try to do a thriller with all the bells and whistles in the world in terms of special effects and stunts, and it can come out very dull. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example. Well, not a perfect example, but I'll give you an example of a movie that should have been thrilling. Uh, it had all the money in the world, but it was boring as hell, in my view. And that was The Matrix 3. The third Matrix movie, to me, they had this gigantic climactic ending with Neo and Trinity and, you know, everybody fighting with the, you know, the robots. And... Let me tell you something. I was sitting in that movie theater and I watched people move move out of the theater while that was happening. I'd never seen anything like that before in a movie. During the climactic scenes, people were so bored, they just left. They didn't even care <laughs> at that point. That was nuts to me. I mean, it was absolutely nuts. But it goes to show you, like, it doesn't matter how much money you have if you don't have a solid screenplay. If you don't have the psychological aspects of the thriller, nobody's going to be invested enough to watch it. They won't care. And Rear Window had none of that stuff. You know, Rear Window was a pretty decently budgeted movie for the time with, a, with you know, name actors, but it, it, it didn't use anything it didn't need to use. You know, it, it had a strong central concept that it worked, you know, and it was different from other movies. It was different from Hitchcock's other movie. Another movie like that is Misery, right? If you've ever seen Misery, Misery to me would be, I guess that would be a thriller too. You know, it's kind of, I don't know, horror, thriller, kind of both. And again, it's a, it's a similar thing. You've got this incredibly vulnerable character played by James Caan, who's injured, can't get out of bed and uh, you know he can't he can't call out he's got no cell phone 
he's stuck. He's stuck with Kathy Bates, who's out of her mind <laughs> and, uh, you know, won't leave him alone until he rewrites his, his book. Spoilers. Um, it's, and it, and it didn't require a lot. I mean, one of the most intense scenes in that movie is, you know, uh, uh, Kathy Bates has to go out and James Caan gets to his wheelchair and tries to, you know, wheel around the house and figure out how the hell am I going to get out of here or how the hell am I going to escape? And, you know, he has to use those few fleeting moments to, uh, figure out where everything is and figure out who she is and see if there's a phone or call for help or something. So that's, those are intense scenes because Khan is vulnerable and, uh, the setup makes him vulnerable. The screenplay, you know, it's based on a Stephen King uh, story or book, I'm not sure. And um, screenplay, by the way, by the man, William Goldman. And it's just great, you know? It's great because the movie doesn't feel like it's rushing to tell you the story. It's got, it's got the setup and it's just gonna dole it out until you get to the end. And it's a satisfying ending. You know, if you have that satisfying ending, if you have the confidence for that payoff, the problem is there are plenty of people in the movie industry they just don't have that kind of confidence. They'll, they'll read a screenplay like Misery and go, no, no, we need exciting stuff to happen. You know, what if there's a, an avalanche and you know, what if, what if there's like five other characters? It's, it's unfortunate, but that's what you have to deal with in the world of movie making and, and the creative world, world in general. They're just people who, despite what you tell them, uh, they think they're creative and they are, everybody's creative, but you know, trying to explain to a client or producer or director or someone who just doesn't get it or really wants to make a different movie, that you know this story builds like this and pays off like that you know a lot of times they don't get it I, I've worked on a couple of movies where unfortunately the producers were just too anxious you know they would take any suggestion that came to them anybody on the set who talked to them for more than five minutes you know their scene might get into the movie it would drive me nuts it would drive me nuts like and it it wasn't that those suggestions were necessarily bad. The problem is you can't just take random suggestions and jam them into something you've crafted to be something. If you've got this character arc, you know, for a screenplay, you, uh, it, it, it gets thrilling and thrilling and thrilling, denouement. You know, that's the arc you want. And somebody starts inserting scenes, it, it ruins the graph. It ruins the pacing, you know? It, it can happen in in other mediums too. It's happened in comics, you know. If you if you if you're doing a comic book story and the beginning's a little too exciting, <laughs> you don't want that necessarily. You might want it to be, you you might want the beginning of the of the comic to be a little dreary, and then build up to something. But even comic book artists, you know, they may have a problem too of of just waiting and seeing that they they want every page to explode off the page and, you know, assault the eyes with these amazing visuals. You don't always need that. You need to put in a story what it needs. You need to follow this arc because that arc works and that's what people like to see. Um, if you don't follow it, if you follow it the opposite way and see where it leads you, you know, nobody's going to get through your movie. <laughs> you know and and yes there are people who defy convention and that arc um, No Country for Old Men was on the list that's a movie that defies I, I don't know if it defies the arc per se but it definitely defies conventional movie making uh, you know formats because the main character big spoiler Big spoiler, if you haven't seen it. Uh, the main character dies in the second act. So, you know, 
that's when you've really got something if you can pull that off. But that's a high wire act. It's a high wire act. Do not attempt. If you're on your first or second screenplay, there's no way you're going to pull that off. No way. You have to be, you have to be a, a real pro. And I don't mean you necessarily have to have a lot of money or, you know, you have to have written a ton of screenplays before you can really start toying with that. The basics. You have to really, for me, I've probably written at least over two dozen screenplays. Uh, yeah, full length. Okay? No, they haven't all been written or, 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 or produced. Uh, I, I've had two produced full length. Um, one of which, you know, I'm not counting the drafts. If you count the drafts, I've written like, uh, I don't know, over a hundred. But, you know, once you've done it for so long that it's second nature, at that point, yeah, you could start maybe experimenting a little. But keep in mind too that, you know, it's hard enough to explain to a movie producer or, or, or director who, who are in the business what's good and what's should be in the film, um, you know, explaining them that next tier of like, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, experimental or, or genius or whatever, you know, uh, that next tier, very few people in the industry get that. Very few people in the world get it. You have to be, you have to be very steeped in your creativeness <laughs> to even get that concept and to pull it off you have to be even better you know Stanley Kubrick was a guy who could do that but he was exceedingly rare guy who had this arduous process of shooting like you know 20 hours of footage and whittling it down to you know a few scenes everybody has their process too so well I'm getting off track anyhow write a thriller <laughs> get out there write a thriller act one act two act three follow the three act structure follow the curve and you should be fine i'm tony d this is screenwriting tips check me out on patreon check me out on the web comic factory and super fat my comic sites and comment and say something nice thank you